Well, thanks everybody for joining me. I'm glad to spend some time with you and hope that your caregiving journey is helped a little bit by some of the things that we'll go over today. If you've begun your caregiving journey recently, or maybe you're looking ahead at the great possibility of becoming a caregiver, these tips and things that I'll be going over with you may give you some extra support, some extra direction that can help. I'm not that great with PowerPoint, so bear with me as I probably stumble through these slides, but they'll help keep me a little bit more organized. One of the first things that you need to have as a caregiver is to make sure you have a certain number of documents on hand. One of the first ones that you need is called a POLST, or a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. It's usually green and it's needing to be posted either on your refrigerator or somewhere where an emergency responder would be able to see it very clearly. It's somewhat like an advanced healthcare directive, but it gives immediate instructions uh, to an emergency person. So if they come on a 911 call and they find someone does not have a pulse, they're going to look at that form. And if it says, do not resuscitate, then they will let nature take its course, which could result in the person's death. But that may be what the person wants. If there is no pulse, they will perform CPR. They will try to do everything they can to bring that person back and take them to the hospital for treatment, whether it's that person's wish or not. So that's a very important form to have, it should be given to you by your physician. If not, there's a great organization called Kokua Mao, and they have the form online. So you can fill it out and then take it to your doctor and say, here, sign this, and then get that thing posted. It's really important. Along with that, an advanced healthcare directive goes into more detail, and it also uh, appoints someone to be a decision maker for you or for the person that you're providing care to. So if you have that advanced healthcare directive and your loved one needs to have medical decisions made, for instance, to have surgery or not to have surgery, uh, to have different types of therapies or not, if your loved one cannot make those decisions for themselves and you're appointed as their medical surrogate in that advanced healthcare directive, you will be able to make those, decis those decisions for them. Some hospitals are very strict about this and others are more family oriented and will kind of ask everybody and come to a conclusion, but they really would prefer to have an advanced healthcare directive. So that's an important one to have also. The durable power of attorney form, Hawaii has a standardized form that you can actually get online but a power of attorney is a very powerful document because it's appointing someone to act in place of the person who's signing off on that power of attorney. If you hold a durable power of attorney and it says that your power goes into effect immediately, that means you can make decisions and sign as though you were the individual who has granted that power of attorney. So a power of attorney in the wrong hands can be devastating. If a person has issued a power of attorney and then becomes incapacitated, the power of attorney cannot be taken away except by a court. So you can imagine somebody that wanted to commit fraud gets a power of attorney. A few months later, they get a declaration of incapacity on that individual they now have the legal positions to do anything that they want for that person. So really, it's an important document to have and it's very important to have the correct name on it. If you need help finding that, just send me a, a note, I'll give you the links. Another power of attorney that most people don't know about, including most doctors, is a mental health advanced, uh, advanced healthcare power of attorney. What this is, is just like your advanced healthcare. This one 
is designed to tell medical professionals what types of medical intervention or drug intervention you would prefer or prefer not to have when it comes to mental health issues. So someone who has uh, a mental health breakdown or has some mental health issue that comes up that has one of these, it could say you could use electric shock therapy or you could use certain types of psychiatric drugs or different types of therapies, or it could say, don't use those. And then the medical professionals will follow that. So it's really important to have that document as well. It's a little harder to find. So just feel free to email me and I'll make sure that you can get the, the forms that you need to fill out and take to your doctor. Now the forms aren't gonna do any good if you can't find them. So you need to put these forms somewhere where you know how to retrieve them. My recommendation is that you give your hospital or your physician or both a copy of them and that you have a copy of them and that you have a copy of them at the place your loved one resides. So important things to have, important things to think about. Another really good thing to have is there's a little booklet called Five Wishes but you can do this on your own. What it is, is asking what a person would like at the end of life, not what medical care they would like, but what other things they would like. Do you want your family around you? Would you like to be indoors, outdoors, in a hospital, at home? All of these questions that we don't like to think about because they have to do with someone's passing, but they're very important in letting someone who is at the end of life have the environment and the people around that they would like to have at that moment. So that's a tough conversation to have and a booklet like Five Wishes can help you go through those questions with your loved one and write some answers down. If you're in a family and you're not the only child, it's very important to make sure that everyone in the family have copies of all these documents so that they're not coming back to you and saying, I don't think mom said that. Why are you doing it this way? And those conversations can get really unpleasant. So think about that and make sure everybody has the same copies. And if the copies get updated, if the information gets changed, which it often does, make sure everybody gets the new copy. So that's the paperwork side. There are other things that are important too with paperwork, but those are the most critical. The next area is the most troublesome, and that's the money. You have to understand the financial situation of the person you're caring for. This can be a really hard conversation. I remember the first time that I began asking my father, who is now 94, for a copy of his trust. And could I see his bank statement so I knew where his finances were? Guess what he asked me? What, you ready for me to die? Popped into his head as the first thing, not, oh, my son is trying to make sure everything's in order. I'm so grateful to him. No, he said, are you waiting for me to die? That wasn't my intent. I wanted to be able to efficiently manage his affairs if I needed to. You're in that position too, very likely. If your loved one has a trust, you need to know the terms of the trust. If you don't understand them, you need to contact the attorney and learn about them because you may be named as the successor trustee and suddenly have all of that responsibility thrust on you. You also need to understand your own situation. What finances are you able to commit, if any, to the care of your loved one? A lot of people tell their parents, I'll take care of you. Don't worry about anything. I'll make it work. That's a foolish thing to say because it could impact not just you, but your family, your spouse, your children. None of our parents have ever raised us saying, when we need help, we expect you to bankrupt yourself to do it. At least I've never come across a parent who has said something in that nature, of that nature. So you need to understand what your financial situation is, 
what your loved one's financial situation is. Where's their money? Do they have investments? Are their taxes up to date? Is their property tax paid? Do they have enough income coming in to take care of uh, health care needs? What about long-term care assistance? Do they have insurance policy? Could they afford care at home? And on a side note, that could be anywhere from thirteen dollars to $25,000. So that's a very substantial amount of money somebody needs to have to provide 24-hour care at home. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, a lot of parents say, you know what? I'm gonna make this real easy. I'm gonna open a joint account with you so that if something happens to me, you have access to the money. That's a mistake. I hate to say it. People will argue with me, but when you open a joint account, each one of you legally owns 50% of that account. If you have an accident, somebody gets hurt on your, hurt on your property and they sue you, your 50% can be attached and taken in a lawsuit. You don't want that kind of liability out there. What you need to do is to have the bank add a authorized signature on the account. And what that means is your parent or your loved one owns the, the account 100%, but you're able to sign checks for them. No, you're not supposed to go and clean out the account, but it is the better way so joint accounts, I really frown on and discourage. When you go to a bank and you don't have a power of attorney and you're not an authorized signer on the account and you say, I need to know mom's balance. You know what the bank is supposed to say? I can't give you that information. That's protected by privacy laws. And perhaps you go to the doctor and you want to be able to access mom's health records. The doctor is supposed to say, I can't let you have that information. You're not her healthcare power of attorney. It's protected under the HIPAA privacy rules. If you've been going to the same doctor for all your life and your parents have been going to the same doctor for all their life, chances are the doctor's going to talk to you anyway. But most of us have changed physicians or our physicians have retired or we're having to go to a specialist for something those individuals are not going to break the privacy laws and you won't be able to get that information. So that's where those healthcare directives and all of those become really important. Signers on a joint account? No. Signers on an individually owned account? Yes, that works. Access to records require those forms, either power of attorney forms or some Physicians, some hospitals have their own forms to allow people access to medical records. So you might want to talk to them about that if they have their own. Queens definitely has their own. Kaiser definitely has their own. So you want to make sure their forms are filled out, giving you authorization to both access records and to discuss care. There are lots of resources available for understanding these, these areas. Nobody expects you to be an attorney. Nobody expects you to be a financial wizard that knows every term. Nobody expects you to be the insurance agent that can explain all of the terms of those contracts. So make use of things like the Bar Association. If you have legal questions, they have a community helpline where they'll help, help you understand legal situations, legal terms. The Legal Aid Society will do the same thing. You can call up the physician, the family physicians association and get help with understanding medical terms, medical information. You can call the UH School of Medicine and ask to speak to a community service person about a drug that you don't understand or don't really feel comfortable with and let them talk to you. So don't ever hesitate to say, you know, this is an area I'm not comfortable with. So what can I do? And if you can't find the right resource, give us a call here at the Caregiver Foundation. We know so many people and know so many uh, resources that we'll be able to connect you with something that will be able to help you. So don't hesitate. The next area that you have to pay attention to is the home. If your parents want to stay at home, 
or your loved one wants to stay at home and not go to a facility, you need to start looking at that facility. And I'll call it a facility because when there's long-term care involved, it becomes a facility, not just a home. So you have to think about practical things. Are there stairs getting into the house? Can mom and dad negotiate those stairs? Or is it likely that they would fall down? I fell on a stair just yesterday. I missed the tread and luckily there was a wall behind me. So I fell against the wall. It can happen in a blink of an eye, just a simple misstep and somebody can go down. In older people that will result almost always in a broken bone or a fractured bone. That's not a good thing in a senior. Breaks and falls that result in breaks are the most common reason that seniors end up in the hospital. When a senior ends up in the hospital with a break, their, their rate of decline and early death is very high. So think carefully about the safety of the home. Maybe you need to build a ramp, bring in a contractor that can build the ramp at the right angle, not too steep. Maybe you have a two-story house. Can you think about one of those chairs that goes up the stairs? More and more people are putting in small private elevators. They're not cheap, but they're much safer than trying to negotiate those stairs. Sometimes you need to renovate a lot. Usually homes have hallways that are pretty narrow. You might wanna have a contractor look at how complicated is it to put in wider uh, hallways. It would mean moving a wall. What about the doors? Are they small enough? to prevent entry with a wheelchair. If somebody's hand's gonna get pinched, you might need to put in a larger door opening. The area that needs addressing the most is the lighting in the house. My parents live in a house that was designed to have these little candelabra type of things on the wall. Those things don't put out any light at all. So their house would look like a cave if we had not gone in and redone the lighting in there. Both of my parents are nearly blind. They need the brightest light they can get or they'll stumble over everything. So look at the house, look at the lighting. That's an area that's fairly easy to change. A regular light fixture can be replaced with an LED flat fixture on the roof and increase the light in that room a hundredfold. So don't hesitate to either look into it yourself or have an electrician come in or a handyman that knows how to do those things properly and make sure and get that lighting up. You don't want shadows. Shadows can look like uh, things that you're gonna fall into. If an individual has dementia and there are shadows, the shadows become very frightening because they don't know what's there. So someone looking at a dark rug in front of a door may say, I'm not, I, I can't go there. There's a hole get rid of the rug or get a lighter one. Although rugs are one of the things you need to look into not having. Rugs are trip hazards. Whether it's permanently installed carpet or the worst are these area rugs that aren't secured. I don't like carpet, I don't like rugs. I usually recommend getting them out, putting this new luxury vinyl floor on them uh, as a replacement. And it makes a much, much safer uh, flooring for your loved one. You need to look at the bedroom. How high is the bed? Is it going to be hard to get from a wheelchair, if your loved one is in a wheelchair, into bed? Can you lower the bed? Do you need to raise the bed? There are some easy ways to raise the bed by putting uh, these, they're not bricks, but they're specially made risers for beds. Put four of them, you can put the bed up much higher if you need to. Or you can lower it sometimes by taking off the uh, frame underneath the bed. But you need to look at it and really think, is it safe for my loved one to get in and out of? What can I do about it? Make sure the bedroom has lighting 24 hours. Night lighting that can show where the door is, show how to get out. If you can, install an emergency call system. There are tons of wireless doorbells now. They make a great emergency call system. 
you put a doorbell right near the bed or on the bed and you put the bell where you're gonna be. They push that, you know it right away. So hopefully they don't just push it to see if you're gonna come. How about the living room? Things like lift chairs. Uh, Sam's and Costco have brought in lift chairs that are much cheaper than they used to be. So they're not cheap, but they're much cheaper. They used to run about $5,000 and now they're down under 2,000. So look into them. It can really make a difference for your loved one to be able to stand up from a seated position by having that chair just push them up. And it's also usually a pretty good recliner. Is the living room cluttered? Maybe you need to take some of those in tables or something out of the, that room so that there is much uh, easier access around the room. I won't use my parents as a good example. Their living room is much too cluttered, but they won't let me move anything. Now, if one of them becomes uh, incapacitated physically, then I will remove things. I hate for it to have to go to that, but I also don't like having to fight with them too much. So if you can convince them that you're redecorating or you're doing something to make the room a lot nicer for them and open it up, go and try that. What about the television? My dad's pretty deaf. You can get these things you can wear in a pocket that are amplifiers. You can get amplifiers directly on the television. You can hook up a, one of these gigantic sound systems and let the whole neighborhood know you can, you can hear the TV. But think about what can I do to make this TV more enjoyable? Our loved ones spend a lot of time in front of the television. There are certain shows they won't miss, that Wheel of Fortune thing. Man, my mom's good at that. I wish she was sitting in the audience. She could make some money. Just think about it and find a way that your loved ones can hear the television and see the television. You know how those new televisions are. They're gigantic. I don't recommend filling an entire wall, but if you can talk them into letting you change that old giant tubed television, to a big flat screen that they can really see, I recommend doing that. How about the telephone? Most of our telephones have little teeny tiny buttons and they're very hard to see. And they're very hard to, ear, to hear if you have any hearing difficulty. Wonderful phones have been made though that have great big numbers. You can pre-program them to grandma, to whoever, granddaughter, and they have volume controls and even amplified uh, earpieces that can make the use of that phone much, much better. The phones that have multiple stations have difficulties for seniors. Uh, they lose them for one thing, they can't find the phone. And also they have fewer, uh, fewer parts of it are designed to complement uh, a senior's needs. So, be very careful with theirs, with those. Computer use. Is your loved one good on the computer? Have they ever used one? There is a thing called a grand pad that has been made. It's a terrific, it's like an I, iPad or a laptop or uh, just a tablet, but you can program it from afar. So you can actually log into that Put in anything you want. You can use it to call people long distance. You can use it for all sorts of things, reading books, watching movies. And they don't know how, they don't need to know how to use it a whole lot because you can log in and make it work for them. So that's a good thing that you might consider looking at. But even if it's just a regular computer, make sure the fonts on the screen are large enough to be read easily. Make sure the speakers are adequate. Make sure that the keyboard is easily used. There's a keyboard that's made with yellow and white. It's much easier to see. So you might look for one of those for your loved one to use um, with their computer. Bathrooms are the number one place where people fall. So if you have a bathtub without skids in it, put some in. Ideally, take the bathtub out. Make it a walk-in shower with grab rails all the way around. 
three sides. You can't put them across the opening, although sometimes I wish there was a way to do that. But you want to make it so that your loved one can safely take a bath as long as they can handle it themselves for as long a period as they can handle it. There may come a time when you need to assist with bathing. I don't want to bathe my parents. That's awkward, but I may have to. I will tell you that most people get through the first bathing and then it becomes pretty routine. Both people put the embarrassment aside. I don't have a problem with it because I was in rehab for quite a bit after back surgery. And one of the things I had to do was to take a shower in front of all these people to prove that I could, that I wouldn't fall down. Well, so my inhibitions are gone. My kids will have a lucky time, even though I hope they won't have to deal with it. But make that shower as safe as you can. When a person steps out of the shower or steps out of the bathtub, it should not be onto a fluffy rug. It needs to be onto something that is secured to the floor so that it won't slip and they won't trip and fall. When they step out, there needs to be another grab bar close by that they can grab onto and hang onto. So really pay attention to that. How about the height of the toilet? Are your parents in a house that was built in the 60s, 70s, 80s? They've got these toilets way down low. Try to sit down on those. If you're unsteady, you're going to fall onto it. Hopefully you get right onto it. Most toilets that are put into homes now are at a much higher elevation. If it's not, go check ones out at Home Depot or Sam's or one place or another and get one that is higher so that your loved one can sit on the toilet more comfortably and with a much safer approach. If your bath has glass doors, I really discourage those because falling against them could result in the door breaking. Even if it has safety glass, it's gonna create a situation where your loved one will probably fall through whatever breaks. So if it has a, a glass door, take it off and put a curtain. Not as convenient, but it's a lot safer. And your bathroom needs to have lighting at night. I recommend going, getting one of the outdoor automatic lights, you know, the ones that you can put up and if somebody walks in front of it, it turns on. There are reasonably decent fixtures that you could put in the bathroom that will do that. So when your loved one opens the door, they step in, boom, the whole room is lit up. You can also put switches, automatic switches on the door and there are companies that will come in and do this for you and make it uh, safer. My mother, who is technically quite blind, still cooks. We have to clean up a lot in the kitchen, but she still cooks. She insists on it. She uses a gas stove. Terrifying. But my dad can see a little bit better, and he keeps a good eye on her. My sister goes up much more frequently than I do and keeps an eye on both of them. And I go up and try to fix everything that gets broken as a result of them insisting on managing their kitchen. But you've really got to consider, is it safe for mom and dad to cook on a stove? If it's not, you need to disable the stove so it can't be turned on. If it's a gas stove, that means having a plumber come in and cap the pipe that brings the gas to the stove so it cannot turn on and fill the room with gas by accident. If it's an electric stove, you can have an electrician come in and take the cord off of the stove completely. You don't wanna just have it unplugged because your loved ones will find the, the plug and plug it back in. It has to be removed completely so it cannot be turned off. Look at the refrigerator. If they reach in for something, are they gonna pull half of the refrigerator contents out onto their feet? You might need to organize it a little bit more efficiently and reduce the number of things that are actually in the refrigerator. We label everything in my folks' refrigerator. So they've got these big labels on them. This is milk, this is juice, this is whatever. And they're able to try with a magnifying glass to make out what that says. And they're more or less used to it now and do a pretty good job. What about dishes? 
Do they have those wonderful dishes that when you drop them shatter and become a real danger? You got to get rid of those. Either plastic dishes or to make your life as a caregiver easier, fancy paper plates. They make beautiful paper plates now. You don't even have to say they're paper plates if you loved ones have uh, vision problems, but then you don't have to wash them afterwards. But get plates, get cups, things that are not going to break if they're dropped. People will cut their feet real quickly, even on plates that are not supposed to break that just sort of break in half. It's still a sharp edge. So be very careful. And then appliances. If there's a blender, I really recommend getting rid of it or having it where only you can access it. Somebody putting something into the blender accidentally turns it on. That could be an absolute disaster. Other types of things, microwaves. In Japan, you can get a microwave that has three pictures, a bottle of sake, a fish, and a bowl of rice. It's pre-programmed. Put a bowl of rice in there, hit the rice bowl. It heats it up. Very simple. I have not seen anything similar in the United States. I don't know why. So if there is a microwave, figure out what the presets could be for items that are gonna commonly be heated. Remember, when it's hot, it's gonna be real hot. So be careful. Figure out a way that they're not gonna reach in and grab something that's gonna scald them or really cause a, a burn. Toaster ovens are one of the primary sources of home fires. So be very careful with those. If they're not using it, but you're gonna use it, make sure you unplug it when you leave, okay? So just think ahead. What could happen if? That's a good way to always look at the home and the things in the home. Now, how about outside the home? If they have a yard, are they gonna be able to take care of the yard? Are you gonna be able to take care of the yard? Do you need to bring in a lawn service? Do you need to bring in somebody to clean up the yard, trim the bushes? Those things are part of caregiving. And a lot of times we don't really think about that. So you have to. So stand there on the road, look at the yard, look at the house, say what kind of maintenance needs to be done? What kind of yard work needs to be done? Find solutions for them. Go in the house, find solutions for any problems that you see in there. It might come to a point where living at home is not a practical solution. Even if you've promised your parents that you would never move them to a home, sometimes that promise may need to be broken because it's in their best interest. Caregiving should not destroy your family. The divorce rate among caregiving, um, caregiving children is extremely high. And you can see why. So be very honest with yourself. You need help in those areas, give me a call. I'll talk to you about it and I'll get you some resources that can help you sort out the caregiving at home or finding placement uh, decision-making process. So think about that. Now, what about hobbies? Parents are going to be home a lot more. Maybe they used to go fishing a lot. Maybe they used to go hiking a lot. Maybe they used to go swimming. Maybe they used to go play mahjong all the time. Are they going to be able to continue those activities or do you need to make provisions to allow them safe participation in those activities? So just think about it. You don't want to cut somebody off from their social, circ social circles and the activities that used to bring them enjoyment but you probably are gonna to need to make adjustments to how those activities are approached and participated in. So those are things that you need to pay attention to as a community, as a caregiver, and whether you're planning it or whether you're already there, really think it through. Community, and pro, uh, community programs can be a real asset. I don't know anybody that wants to go to quote daycare. It's not daycare. They're day programs. Seniors don't go to babysitting services. Most of the day programs have good activities. Some of them even have outings. 
Some of them have staff that are extremely well trained. They can help somebody feel okay about spending a lot of time during the day at a place with other seniors and people who can help them. The, your parents are gonna say, I don't wanna go there. That's all old people. I don't wanna go, I'm not going. Figure out a way to bribe them, to convince them to try it. Because once somebody actually tries it for two or three times, chances are they're gonna enjoy the socialization that they're able to have. I had a lady who said, she's never going to one of these things. Absolutely not. They treat you like an old person. We talked her into going, came home. I'm not going back. Talked her into going again, came home. Uh, it's not that bad, but I don't like it. The third time she went, she came back. She didn't say anything. But the next morning she said, well, when are we going? From then on, she was going every day enjoying it. She said, you know, there's a lot of old people there that can't really do anything, but at least they're not stuck at home in front of the TV. There's somebody to talk to. So don't ever just rule those out because dad says, I'm not going. Figure out a way to get the program tried by your dad or your mom. Some long-term care insurance policies will pay the cost of long-term care day services. So if they have a program, I'm sorry, if they have a long-term care policy, take a look at it or call up the company and ask if day program is uh, something that that policy can cover. The hardest one to deal with is transportation. When I was a little kid, I don't know how old I was, but this event, lodged in my brain. My dad was standing by a croton bush with my grandfather and my grandfather's car. And my dad held out his hand and said, Pops, give me the keys. My grandfather gave him the keys, but it must have been such a psychologically taught situation that it lodged in my brain. And growing up, I always would tell my dad, don't ever make me do that. I don't ever want to have to ask you. you. You tell me. Oh, thank goodness. He actually did. One day he had had a near miss on the highway. And he came home, called me up. He said, come get the keys. I said, oh. He said, yeah, I could have ended up killing somebody. I got him. His truck sat on the property for probably six months before he said, well, let's get rid of it. Lucky me, you may not be so lucky. You may have to come to some weird way of trying to disable the truck to the point where it can't operate. Maybe it gets stolen, although your parents will probably call the police and report it. They may call a mechanic to come fix it. You might need to really get aggressive and say right to their face, you cannot drive anymore, it is not safe. I've taken away the keys. I'm gonna get rid of the vehicle. And they will be really pissed off at you. And it's okay. You can live through that and it will settle back down. But you have to make a responsible decision when it comes to vehicles. But you can't just do the key removal business part of it. You've got to figure out how are they gonna get anywhere? My parents live far away from a bus line. There is no bus service. Their house is down a long driveway that's made out of gravel. They would have to walk from their house to the road to get a handy van. They're not able to do that. So we have to try and figure out how we can get the handy cab to come pick them up. That costs more money. It's a difficult situation, but if you don't have an alternative, what you've done is put your loved one in jail and thrown away the key. So think about it. Figure out a schedule. Who can pick up this person? Take them shopping. Is Uber or a Lyft service something that is reasonable? Can they access Handyvan? Can they access the bus line? 
you are going to end up being transportation a lot of the time. I'm very fortunate that my sister lives fairly near to my folks. So she gives them rides to the doctor and rides to shopping and different things far more than I can. I live 45 minutes away from them if there's no traffic, two hours if there is. Think about it carefully. You don't want your parents to feel like you've locked them up. Uber and Lyft, it works. Handy van's a fabulous service. You know, most counties in the United States don't have anything like our handy van system or our bus system. Someday the train will be running, but who knows when or if. I wouldn't count on that one. Come up with other ways to get your loved one moving around and able to still participate in things. You want them to be able to go shopping. You want them to be able to go see their friends. If your dad used to go to have coffee every morning at McDonald's with his buddies, figure a way to make that still happen. Maybe not every day, but maybe every other day. But think it through. You might need to develop a schedule. Your life runs on a schedule. You probably have a job. That job has a schedule. Caregiving becomes a job. And you need to develop a schedule to help you manage that. So really think this area through. And then the area that's most important in caregiving is you. If you're the caregiver, you become the lifeline, you become the maid, you become the housekeeper, sometimes the cook, usually the yard man. You are an extremely important person in caregiving. Your roles will become more and more depended on by your loved ones. And you've got to remember that you have a life. You have to protect that. Otherwise, you will become so consumed by caregiving that everything else falls away. Perhaps your family falls away. Perhaps all your friends fall away. Your health falls away. Your finances fall away. And you burn out but you've burned up all your resources. You can't do that, not and be a good caregiver. So you've got to really be understanding about your own resources. What are they? What can you commit? Can you commit anything? Some people can't even commit time. And that's just the way it is. We had a, a family that was having a big problem with their older brother. He wouldn't come visit dad, he wouldn't come help, he wouldn't do anything. He'd give them money once in a while, but that was it. And the two sisters were very resentful. So we sat down for a family meeting, began the meeting, and he was there. He came because I asked him to. We started talking about the reality of caregiving being a way of saying goodbye. He stood up and walked out and would not come back. I looked at his sisters and said, what was that about? And they said, oh, he can't stand the thought of them dying. He can't handle that. So I looked at the sisters and I said, so why are you grumbling about him not participating in caregiving? If you know the answer to that, you need to accept that answer and not become all bent out of shape and have your family fly apart because everybody is resentful. So be realistic about people's resources, both emotionally and financially and physically, and understand what yours are. You need to set boundaries for yourself. My boundary is I will not leave my wife to take care of my parents. My parents understand that. They agree with it, although they're a little bit hurt but they understand that I have a family and I need to be faithful and strong with that family. As a caregiver, you need that family. You need that person of you connected with other people to give you input, to give you love and comfort and sympathy, to give you things that you need to build you up as a caregiver and make you a stronger person. You also need to be able to accept changes. 
your parents are going to change. Things are different. When someone needs caregiving, things are very different. They're not the same. Your parents may develop dementia. They may have a physical condition that really changes their ability to do things. You have to be able to accept that, not try to fix everything. You can't cure aging. It happens. You have to be able to accept the fact that dad's eyesight, in my case, is going to be zero probably in another year. My mother's eyesight is 95% gone already. I have to be able to accept the fact that she can't see me anymore. It really makes her upset. Dad keeps trying to use his shop. He has band saws, chainsaws, drills. He's got all this equipment that he's still trying to use. I can't stop him yet, but I also have to accept the fact that he may become injured as a result of his stubbornness. And it's not my fault because cognitively he is very sharp and he has the right to make his own decisions, even stupid ones. So the biggest thing you can do as a caregiver is ask for and accept help. When somebody comes up to a caregiver and they say, well, how are you doing? The caregiver goes, oh, everything's fine. Well, it's, it's, it's hard, but we're doing fine. No problem, no problem. Liar. It's not. You've got to be able to be honest with someone who says, can I help you? Say yes. But yes is not enough because if you're not specific, they don't know what to do. So if somebody comes up to you and you're giving a lot of care to your loved ones and says, can I help you? Say yes. Can you fix dinners on Tuesday? They like to eat at six o'clock. I'd love to be able to take a walk. Could you do the laundry? Could you mow the yard? Be specific. You'll be amazed how many people will do something for you if they know what you need done. So you need to ask for and you need to accept help. Please. Otherwise, you're going to get on the phone to me and you're going to say, I'm burnt out. I can't take this anymore. I'm leaving. And I had someone do that. It was one of these strange situations where an ex-wife was taking care of her ex-husband. And I got a phone call and she said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I said, who are you? She told me her name. I said, where do you live? She told me. I said, so what's going on? I've been caring for him for two years. I came back just because I thought nobody else would. And he's still alive. And I'm just about dead and I'm leaving the taxi's coming I said well can he get out of bed no can he feed himself no is he incontinent yes there's no one she said I don't know anyone he doesn't have any friends he doesn't have any help so that's why I'm calling you do something about it I'm gone I'm not adult protective service this is the caregiver foundation we don't have people we can send out in a situation like that, but got on the phone to Adult Protective Service, got on the phone to HPD, got on the phone to Catholic Charities, dragged somebody out of whatever they were doing over to that residence, and she was gone. And he was in bed and already needed changing. So don't let yourself get to a point where it's that critical. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. Now, there are tons of resources available, uh, both online, and that's a wonderful tool for all of us that like to easily find resources. There are great resources in the community. You can call the Aging and Disability Resource Center. It's commonly called the ADRC, or you can call the city's Office on Aging. Those are good places. You can call the Caregiver Foundation. You can contact Catholic Charities. AARP has a lot of resources. There's tons of resources out there that are designed to give you training, to give you help, to give you understanding on different areas, to give you support, both emotionally and otherwise. So you're not alone. 
even though you might feel you're alone, you're not alone. But you've got to make the first step of looking for some resources. Our website has a lot on it. There are about 130 pages of different things there. So I recommend using the search bar. But there are other websites. There are organizations that will help you build a plan. If you look online, you can find things like a caregiver's notebook that can help you plan. And it's free. Some of the caregiving agencies, the different case management agencies will help you, will come in and help you design a plan. Now, they would like to provide you with some caregivers as well, and that might be a very smart thing to do if you can afford it, but many of them will help you develop a plan that will work for you. Caregiving is not something you would want to do by the seat of your pants. You want to plan it out and stick with a plan. So I hope these tips have been a little bit helpful for you, and I'm happy to entertain any kind of questions or comments that you might have. Debbie? Thanks, Gary. That was a lot of great information. Um, I know it's 10.55. Uh, we have five minutes uh, to get through some of the questions. Um, so let's start off. Uh, do you have to post the original green post um, on your refrigerator, or could you post a copy? A copy is fine. No problem. Great. And do I still need a POA if I'm an only child and everything is either joint account or under a trust? If you are the successor trustee, then you already will have control of whatever is in the trust. The difficulty might be that there could be accounts and things outside of the trust. Um, again, on the co on the joint accounts, I really caution you on that. But if you have those positions already, then as far as the accounts and the trust is concerned, you have the positions. Other things though, like applying for an ID, signing an insurance form, signing, signing uh, anything to do with a legal situation, you're still gonna need that power of attorney. Thank you. I hope that answered the question. Um, here's another question. How do I get a case manager? Oh. There are many different agencies. Uh, you can look online, you can give me a call. I can give you some uh, references to case management agencies that we use and have been pleased with. Uh, they're a wonderful resource and can really make a difference in everybody's life. So drop me an email, give me a call. I'll be glad to give you some names. Okay. Uh, do you know if for those transporter vans, is there a way to seek reimbursement on the Big Island? A three mile or about 10 minutes round trip costs $90. Is the handy van accessible? It's not as convenient, but it certainly is less costly. So that's, that's something I would look into. Sometimes the handicap will be subsidized. Uh, you'd have to talk to the handy van people about that, whether or not they can be subsidized. Outside of that, Catholic Charities sometimes provides transportation for certain things like medical transportation. And there are some other organizations that periodically will provide group transportation. It's usually just for medical appointments and things like that, not for shopping or going to the beach or you know, other things. Thank you. Um, next, can you give the resource list you mentioned again? Um, Gary, if that is better, did you want to maybe send me a list of the resources you mentioned and then I can just send an email yes. to the entire group? Um, that way, okay. everyone will have access. I, I will be sending you a list uh, and it will have other resources on it as well uh, that I have found useful and other people have found useful. So. I will be glad to do that. One of the things that I recommend is getting a book called The 36-Hour Day. It's a very good, comprehensive look at caregiving. You might want to check that out. Great. So I will send that to you folks um, sometime today or after I get that from Gary. Uh, will this recording be posted and available online? Yes, it will. Um, we also have 
uh, Gary's webinar from last year on, on our website as well. That one is on preventing caregiver burnout. So he provides a lot of good information on that too. If you wanna check that out. Um, oh, referring back to the handy van or the transport van question. Not really for handy van. You need to call 24 hours before to make arrangements. This was yes. a minute request. Last minute requests are gonna end up being Uber or Lyft or taxi. So I don't know of any other resource for that. Or you. <laughs> um, and can you please provide CPR training resources? The American Red Cross is probably the gold standard for CPR training, but you can also get CPR training from some of the day programs. I know that Holly Haoli has someone that uh, does CPR training. Um, the fire, fire department periodically will have community CPR classes and they're usually tied together with first aid classes, uh, emergency first aid. Now that people are getting back together, uh, in-person training is becoming more available. You can also contact AARP. They don't have the classes directly, but sometimes they will um, cooperate with some other organization. They'll sponsor an organization to provide particular training. They have sponsored us uh, in the past on some specific training. Um, but I would start with Red Cross. They also have a very comprehensive online caregiver training program that goes into bathing, dressing, changing diapers, uh, managing medications. It's a really good, uh, good program. And we have what is called the caregiver uh, boot camp that we'll begin having those sessions again. And we're gonna have them online this, this year. Uh, and I'll be putting information out about that. I'll make sure Debbie gets that information. So check with her. And uh, if you are on our Facebook page, our blog, you would see the information there and it'll also be posted on our website. But it's four 90 minute sessions that go in, goes into depth in many, many of the areas that I touched on today, but it gets real specific. So you can benefit from that as well. 